click over here. One sec. Okay. Okay, we're good. Okay. Welcome, Catherine, to the Biohacker Babes. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes. One of our favorite topics. We're going to talk about metabolic health and CGM. So our audience really loves CGMs. And we're really thrilled that these, these devices are becoming more and more accessible to a non-diabetic healthy population. Though, of course, we could argue that diabetes exists on a, a spectrum. It's not an on-off switch for diabetes. So really fantastic opportunity to see where you fall on that spectrum. And since our fellow biohackers are pretty familiar with the basics of glucose testing, it'll be really fun and interesting to take a deeper dive into some of the bigger trends that you're seeing, how it relates to hormones, the menstrual cycle. We're going to like do a timeline through women's health. Don't worry, we'll do some, some men's health as well. And, <laughs> but I think just to kick off, give us a basic overview. Like, why is this such a powerful tool, both short-term and long-term for our health? Yeah. I, we get this a lot, right? People say, I don't have a diagnosis. You know, wh why would I want to use this tool? This isn't, you know, what, how is this going to apply to me and my lifestyle? And we talk about that both in terms of the short-term and the long-term benefits of a tool like a CGM. So in the long-term, as you're, you and your audience probably already knows, is that by decreasing your glucose variability, you can decrease your risk for chronic disease. And that's sort of a marathon outlook, right? Is that you're taking control now preventatively so that later on in life, you are feeling your best, right? You are biohacking your, you know, the, the, the next couple of decades. So really what we want to see is again, when we look at metabolic health, when we look at even metabolic syndrome, which is sort of the opposite of metabolic health, remember there are those five factors. And one of those factors uh, is good glucose control or, or poor glucose control. So, so we want to make sure that we are optimizing it. So that's really the long-term goal for, some, for using a tool like this. And in the short term, it's really all about how you feel. When you have good glucose control, when you are not having high variability, high swings, you are feeling good. You have sustained energy. You are not uh, cranky or tired or, you know, scrambling for your next snack or meal. Um, when you have poor glucose control, when you have higher swings and crashes and dips, trust me, you are feeling like that, you know, 2 p.m. slump, the 4 p.m. cookies, the poor sleeping at night. Uh, you just, you feel dysregulated is, is probably one of the most powerful words that I think people are really beginning to understand and use. So in the short term, taking control and learning as much as you can about how your body is processing food and how it's being shown in your glucose data can have a very short-term positive impact on your health. Yeah. Yeah. I love all of that. And I love the prevention part. I mean, it's so hard to reverse disease. I mean, it's possible. It's just, it's so much harder if we can start preventing things. It's such a game changer. And, and like Lauren said too, I'm excited that, you know, more of us are able to get our hands on the CGM. And actually I was at the gym, um, a couple of weeks ago on my last NutriSense trial and a friend of mine there who works in healthcare, she comes over and she's like, are you okay? What, what's going on on your arm? Are, is, are you diabetic? Are you okay? I'm like, oh, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm just testing things out, you know, seeing what foods do to my body. And, um, but I think just that she was so alarmed by that on the back of my arm, but I think we're going to keep seeing that trend that it's, it's a, it's a thing for those of us that are healthy and want to prevent disease. So it's an exciting time. I mean, honestly, I think instead of getting an annual lab draw, you know, a finger stick at one or, you know, or, or whatever it is, um, for your annual physical, why not have a more continuous, bigger picture view of what your body is doing every year, right? And then you can even track it over time. You know, two years ago during COVID, it was X, Y, Z. Now that, you know, I, lifestyle has changed, yada, yada. And now I'm here. I mean, being able to see that data, not just for a moment in time, like you get a lab draw at an annual physical, but, but to see really, how are you doing in the month of April? How are you doing in the month of May year over year is really, I think more powerful. And you're able to sustain those healthy habits, knowing that you have that track record. Yeah, yeah, especially because yeah. the body is so dynamic, everything's changing every single day. And so that snapshot in time, like you said, with the lab draw, and then we add in white coat syndrome, you know, 
people's cortisol levels going up. It's not really a true, I think, reflection of what's happening in your physiology in that moment. So at home in your own environment, being able to test your your glucose is just so wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, as, as I was saying, you know, the, the lab draws fasted when what we want to see is really, how are you responding to the foods that you're eating on a daily basis? I mean, you know, fasting glucose is of course an important metric as well, but, but I, that glycemic variability is really fascinating to see how is your body responding to oatmeal? How is your body responding to, um, you know, the salad at lunch and then sitting at your desk for the afternoon, that's way more powerful than, you know, Tuesday morning in February, you know, on, you know, one day. Yeah. 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 I mean, I tend to see a higher fasting glucose when I go to quest or lab core than when I'm at home, it's almost like a 15, 20 point difference for me. Um, Interesting. yeah, yeah. Just, I mean, you're getting in your car, you're stressed, you're driving, you know, it's like, uh, mm -hmm. how much blood are they going to take today? It's like eight tubes. Oh my gosh. You know, it's like, it's so much <laughs> happening versus just waking up and pricking your finger real fast. We're using like, a CGM, like of course. Eight tubes is a good day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, oh my God. They took 20. <laughs> yeah. 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 When they yeah. keep refilling them and you're like, wait, <laughs> what are we testing? <laughs> yeah. How many more do we have? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So many things there. Yeah. Um, well, and so something that you said that kind of stood out in my mind is, you know, the afternoon slump. I want to talk about that real quick, because I think a lot of people experience that. And some people think it's pretty normal, like, oh, I'm just tired. I just had lunch. You know, it's my afternoon, you know, slump. But like, what's really happening there? Like, how often is that from poor blood sugar control? And is it a bad lunch? Is it a bad breakfast? Is it that they slept poorly? Like, how much is playing into that afternoon slump most people experience you a b c d every everything that everything. that you just that you just named so first and foremost we will look at um your lunch right we will look at, at sort of the the last thing that you ate and many people are doing intermittent fasting these days it's it's popular um we are i like to just say we are kind of agnostic to dietary patterns and you know if you if you feel very passionate about intermittent fasting we at NutriSense are there to help you optimize that right if you feel passionate about breakfast we are there to help you optimize your breakfast um, so we don't, we don't, uh, adhere to any one, uh, style or approach. So what we will find sometimes with, um, the afternoon slip, it can be there, uh, they have broken a fast and perhaps they've broken their fast as your audience may know with carbohydrates first or with a higher carbohydrate meal, something where they're hitting their system with, you know, maybe rice or bread or something like that. And it's just, Bam, it is, it's sort of sh shooting your glucose up pretty high. And then you are having what we call a reactive hypoglycemic episode where the body will sense that incoming glucose. It will overcompensate by producing uh, more insulin than you really need for that amount of glucose coming into your system. And it will actually bring your glucose down below where you started. So that can be accompanied with feelings of fatigue, nausea, dizziness, you know, just feeling angry, kind of gross. And then many people then opt for another snack after that, right? Or they opt for another cup of coffee and then they are putting more caffeine in their system later in the day, which again, we can go into caffeine as well. Um, and that can set off sort of another roller coaster of glucose uh, levels after that. So we will look at meal composition. Absolutely. We will look at prior meals. So whether they are fasted or whether they had a breakfast, we will also look at exercise. Did they eat that meal at a restaurant and then drove back to their desk where they then sat for another four hours? Or did they eat that lunch and then they you know, took a walk or you know they, they, they were able to move around afterwards? Was there any type of movement or, or exercise done after your meal? We also look or, or exercise done earlier in the day. Perhaps uh, this is a person who wakes up and goes to the gym early in the morning. Therefore, they've exercised and used up their stores of glucose uh, from the night before. So all of that takes into a factor. Absolutely, like you said, if they had a poor night's sleep, if they didn't sleep well the next day, we are less sensitive to uh, insulin. We will react a little bit higher to certain meals um, than if we had had a great night of sleep. And so all of those things, and then maybe stress. Maybe they are having this crash because they had a very stressful meeting at lunch or they got into an argument with someone midday. 
their stress levels skyrocketed and then they dropped right back down. So that's sort of the the beauty and the beast of the of the glucose data is that we can see so much that we have to figure out what do we really think is driving these these different changes. Yeah, yeah endless variables. So you just have to keep going around the wheel checking all of the things off, but definitely sleep and stress. I find sometimes are even more powerful than the food, but we're very quick to demonize food because we are more food focused. And this came through kind of a more food focused conversation, but yeah, I feel like if you got poor sleep, it's almost not worth nitpicking what you ate for breakfast. It's like, let's go to the next day. Let's start with a clean slate of data. Right. That's just not going to be an optimal day. I wanted to circle back to the reactive hypoglycemia. Cause I think this is really interesting. I think this comes from poor diabetic advice where diabetics are taught to eat a piece of candy or drink some orange juice to fix. There's like this band-aid solution, maybe not always the most optimal because we're just going to perpetuate the roller coaster. So what is your best advice for getting off of that roller coaster? If you are seeing like a big, uh, sharp increase and then a big dip where you would feel really lethargic suddenly, or then feel like you need to overcorrect by just continuing to eat the carbs. Yeah, we'll talk about, uh, I'll, I'll talk to people about the composition of the meal and the order in which they ate their macros uh, at first. I'm not going to start with, you need to delete all the carbohydrates at your meal. It's more of a conversation of, okay, let's think about the portion sizes of, of the carbohydrates. Can we swap one for a less processed version to give yourself some fiber? And how can we eat the same foods, but perhaps in a different order in order for the body to better maximize the incoming glucose. And again, seeing if there's anything coming in before that. So say they are, uh, this is a, a meal, you know, they haven't eaten in at least three or four hours. Um, we're going to want to say, well, let's try eating some protein, some fiber, some fat first. Let's prime the pump. Let's, let's hit the system with something that isn't going to skyrocket, you know, Hit, hit your glucose, uh, uh, hit, hit your bloodstream super fast. And the protein will help sort of start the wheels rolling, but it will mitigate the spike. And so we'll talk about just changing the order in which you're eating, or maybe selecting something that you can have that's higher in protein or fat first, have half of an avocado to start, um, you know, maybe with a salad, maybe with some chicken or something like that and, and swapping out how you're having those, those carbohydrates so that you can help. And then you know, making sure that you're having those other macros along with it. It might just be a very high carbohydrate meal. That's fine, but let's then add some things into it that you can eat first before you have whatever it is that you were having before. Yeah, I think yeah. prevention is probably the best path forward. But what if someone like our biohackers are really curious about just trying, experimenting with different things. And a lot of people, when they first put their CGM on, they just want to observe, not making any changes. Let me just observe natural occurrences. I eat watermelon. I get a big spike. I get a big dip. And then you feel terrible. What do you do? I would say after the fact, uh, yeah. I would say walk yeah. around, right? Walk Take around walk. and drink something. Cause sometimes it can also be an issue of dehydration, depending again on like your exercise ability, your exercise, uh, workouts earlier in the day, I would say drink something and walk around. Um, the body will re-regulate itself. You won't stay down there. Um, you know, the body will, will start to bring you up, but instead of you know, volleying back up into a high spike because you ate something, it's better to, you know, bring it up with a little bit of more natural ways. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I have a funny story real quick about that walking after a meal. I was just in Austin with um, some friends that live there. The wife is a full, full on biohacker and the husband is the semi biohacker. He doesn't do it for a living, but it was so funny. Every time we went out to eat, the second we finished paying the bill, he goes, he would stand up and say, glucose, glucose, glucose. We got to go. We got to go. <laughs> like, I mean, and he's worn a CGM before, so he's aware of that. But he was like, we're not going to sit here and just chat. The bill is paid. We're going to walk. <laughs> glucose, glucose. That's amazing. Yeah. It's a great habit to get in. But I think it also can go the other uh, end of the spectrum where people are just so obsessed with normalizing and optimizing and balancing their glucose on the back end that it kind of drives a more neurotic cycle. So like building in natural exercise, I'm not saying that he is, but building, building in more natural movement throughout your day, rather than being like, oh my God, I ate. Now I have to walk it off. Cause I think that doesn't build good long-term habits. Yeah. What he was being funny about it, but 
but I get it. he always is. I know who you're talking about. He's hilarious. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I know um, it's you know, people yeah. ask us, you know, like what's, what's an easy way, you know, what's something that I can do that isn't super invasive or expensive or anything like that to help manage my glucose. And I always say, I had this lame saying, my husband always rolls, rolls his eyes after you eat, move your feet. And it's the same thing, yeah. right? It's not obsessive. It's not like we have to get our 20 minute quick pace workout in, but it's just, you can move your feet around your house. You could do laundry, you know, save some, some chores or something that you have to do during, uh, you know, during the nighttime after you eat, but it's so important not to sit there and watch TV and, you know, zone out with Netflix. It's really important just to get up. And when you think about healthy lifestyles all around the world, these people are active after their meals, right? They're not just sitting around, maybe they're walking to and from a restaurant or walking to and from someone's house you know, to eat, or, you know, maybe they've walked to get their groceries somewhere. Like there's lots of movement around, around the meals. Yeah. Such a great biohack. And I, I just I have to say, I love this conversation because this is a, you know, using the CGM as a biohack that is empowering us to make better choices. It's not like, okay, here's the data. There's nothing you can do. There's so much we can do for glucose. I think it's so, so amazing. So I just wanted to throw that in there real quick. So I love that. So after you eat, move your feet, definitely <laughs> like put that on so my good. wall. Love that. <laughs> um, yeah. I would love to talk about caffeine because caffeine seems to be one of those interesting ones. Like I personally do not see a glucose spike when I have caffeine, but I know for some people it's a real issue. Um, so what do you typically see with, with most people for that? It's, it's, it is totally true. Some people, it just spikes their glucose. Sometimes we have to dig in a little deeper and say, was that really black coffee or was there maybe something else in there? Um, mm -hmm. so uh, okay. just, you know, you, you kind of have to unpack. I'm sure your audience would never add anything like that to their coffee, but, um, you know, we, we, we do s sometimes tend to see that in terms of the caffeine. Also, it depends on when they're drinking it. I do think it's really interesting about the natural hormonal fluctuations in the morning and the natural rise in cortisol. And, 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 and we do see that natural rise in glucose during that four to 8 a.m. period. And sometimes people are drinking coffee on top of that, right? And so what you're seeing is maybe even a compounding effect. But what I think is so interesting is that if you just wait until those natural hormones subside a little bit, and then you have your coffee a little bit later, you will you will feel the the impact of that caffeine even more so because it's not getting uh, negated by your natural um, hormonal cycles early in the morning. But um, so, so we will see that. And also just some people naturally are more impacted by that caffeine uh, intake into their system. And some people aren't just like some people can drink, a, you know, a coffee or an espresso after dinner and go right to sleep. Other people are up you know, all night long. And I think the half-life of, ca I think caffeine can live in the body. I think it stays in the body for a, a good number of hours. So um, if you know that it's, yeah. you're, you're pretty sensitive to it, a lot of people will stop drinking coffee after noon, you know, after the noon time period, just because they don't want it to be living in their system for all that long. Yeah. yeah. We've been hearing six hours for so long, but Renee, you found some information recently that says it stays in your system for three days. So potentially- you could think you're getting really good sleep, but could it be even better if you fully cycle it out of your system? Right. Yeah. And then some people, they said, actually the half-life is like two hours. Those are the people like our mom who can have coffee before bed. So it could be two hours. It could be 72 hours. Like what a wide <laughs> range of right. a half-life. Yeah. And if, you, if you're, if you're struggling with sleep or it's something that you're really interested in optimizing again, having the glucose monitor, I like to compare it to a little window inside your body. I mean, you can really test out and we always say it's an N equals one experiment, right? It's a, you are the experiment. It's only you that, that we're looking at and testing different things out. So what better way to see, okay, I'm going to go caffeine free for a week. Um, let me see how that changes my fasting glucose numbers, or let me see how that changes my, um, you know, my response to breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I think it's really interesting to be able to have that ability to make those tests and see how it it impacts you in real time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I have seen that overnight dip. So maybe we can talk about that. Like for me, I'll see like at the two to 3 a.m. dip. Typically I'll wake up, I'll go to the bathroom. Like I can see that, you know, right in sync there. But I quite often will see it when I eat dinner 
really early. Like if I eat dinner at five or six and I don't eat anything else for the rest of the night, which you would think, oh, I'm fasting. It's great. But I'll see that glucose dip. And I don't know if it's, I have a lower body fat percentage. Maybe is it adrenal issues? I shouldn't be fasting. Like, is it okay to have a snack before bed to prevent that blood sugar dip? Absolutely. We see that a lot of times. Um, it, it seems to be mostly women that, that notice it and, and, you know, they wake up for whatever reason, uh, and they, they're finding that they're waking up can be any age. Doesn't really, uh, doesn't really jive with, uh, necessarily where you are, uh, in your life cycle, but it can be really interesting to try those different snacks. And many women are, nervous about eating before bed and, you know, they don't want to be taking in more calories than they should, but we really try and promote, listen, if it's going to help you get better sleep, that will then drive even more positive results the next day. So obviously at night, sometimes we'll recommend a small amount of carbohydrate, right? Similar as you would recommend to, you know, old school type one diabetics, right? Something that's got like some protein, fat and fiber to it in a small amount, right? Just so that the body can maintain that steady state. You're not having a huge spike in a crash, nor are you sort of steady state and dipping down below if the body doesn't have enough uh, uh, glucose floating around. So absolutely, we'll, we can play around with different things. Maybe it's a Greek yogurt. Well, you know, that didn't go so great. Okay, let's try something like, like uh, a little bit of uh, uh, berries and nuts, you know, let's try a couple different combinations. Maybe it's a cheese stick for someone that uh, uh, likes that kind of thing, just to see what works best for you. I always say, you know, try and if you find you're waking up to pee, maybe we should, you know, cut back on, on drinking a lot of water right before bedtime, or you know, maybe you're a little bit dehydrated or something. You can always play around with these variables. And again, if you're eating really early and then you're maybe working or at your desk or something all night long, you haven't moved, right? It, a lot of it is lifestyle. It's like, so what are you doing before you're then getting into that rested state? What's happening in your body? And some people are working out at night, right? Are you using up all of your glucose stores right before you go to bed? Mm, yeah. I think that willingness to experiment is so important because it's so personal. And I think challenging the narrative, you know, everyone is talking about, oh, don't eat three hours before bed. Well, maybe that's not the best for you, but we hear right. this advice and I think we are subconsciously are conditioned to follow it. And then we think it's bad if we go against it. But I love what you said, like experimenting, let's try this and let's try that and pay attention and see what works best for you. Exactly. Exactly. All and kinds of things. And it'll change, right? It'll, it'll, it'll change as your, you know, the stresses in your life change. And as, um, you know, the, just the different lifestyle factors, uh, we're not always the same year after year. Yeah. Yes. Which we will get into yeah. with the menstrual cycle and how that changes. <laughs> but I'm curious about your kind of general approach to carbohydrates, because there is such a push for intermittent fasting and lower carb. And I think people start testing their glucose and they go, oh my gosh, if I just eat low carb and eat fats, my glucose is good. Like, I think there's also this subconscious conditioning of, I'm going to try to flatline because a flatline appears to be better, but you know, we're learning more about these nuances and we do want this natural energy cycle, but I see that as a common issue of especially women, maybe avoiding carbohydrates, maybe not in the evening or right before bed, but just over the course of a day, getting, uh, those carbohydrates across the blood brain barrier. So we get the tryptophan, the serotonin and the melatonin to go to sleep and sometimes see seeing sleep disruptions because of just not enough carbohydrates. So how do you approach, I guess, specifically to women, how do you approach carbohydrates? Yeah. Again, um, we, we do not prescribe any type of uh, particular diet or anything like that at NutriSense. And we're really there to help meet people wherever they are. Um, and obviously we want to get that baseline. Um, what are you currently taking in? Um, you know, do you say you're low carbohydrate, but actually on the weekends you are just blowing it out and, you know, going, you know, going totally crazy. Um, you know, are you saying that you're lower carbohydrate, but actually when we go through it, you're, you're, you know, you're hitting higher levels than you might think you are. So we always try and just get a baseline sort of intake for a couple of weeks. Let's just see where you're at before we make any bigger changes. And then absolutely, we always try and swap it as all good dietitians do, right? We try and swap in the, the, the better option for that, right? If you're going to have the white bread, we always try and swap in some whole wheat, right? We're always trying to encourage those healthy carbohydrates. Um, if you really like tropical fruits in your smoothie, but they tend to be spiking you, well, let's lower the portion size of the pineapple and increase um, something like a berry that has more 
more fiber content to it. So um, those are really, you know, we want to make sure that people are getting the carbohydrates. And again, a lot of it is, is counseling and it's just knowing where your member is on their willingness to change and on that change continuum. If they're pretty beholden to that smoothie that's spiking them, well, okay, let's think about something else. <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> you know, I, I've had members that say, I, I am adamant that I go out to dinner with my husband every week. It's our special time together. And that's okay. Absolutely. That, that is what you guys do. And we're going to optimize that around it. So, um, also I'm eating dinner at 9 PM and you can't change that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, we get a lot of foodies and I, I always tell people, I say, you go to the, like a, a, a nice restaurant and I promise you, your glucose will not spike just because the food, you know, the preparation of the food and the portion size is, is really going to be you know fine. Um, mm -hmm. but we do see, you know, we do see spikes with sushi. We do see spikes with oatmeal. We do see spikes with foods that people are like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that was, you know, that was going to spike me. I can't believe it. Um, and I do encourage people to try pasta, right? I always say, you know, what, what, what food maybe are you afraid of seeing what happens? Let's do it. Is it a donut? Do you love donuts? Do you have a donut like once a month and you love it? Let's have one. And then you don't have to be afraid of having it, right? Or have the donut and, and we'll now make a healthy habit around it so that you can enjoy it. And for so many women, there are so many emotional feelings around the food that they eat. And so I think this can be an empowering way to take charge of their health and the foods that they choose, knowing that they can broaden what they're eating. They can maybe broaden their carbohydrate intake, knowing that they have these tools and tips and tricks uh, in order to mitigate the glucose spike. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you just brought up a really interesting point about like, I would say like, quote unquote, healthy foods that are actually more problematic. And I some of my highest spikes have been from things that you would think are healthy. Right. Cassava, <laughs> cassava root flour, gluten-free, vegetarian pizza or flatbread, which I don't really love the taste of it, to be honest, but it, it that was my highest spike ever. It was it hit 200. I'm like, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. So I immediately cut it out because I didn't even enjoy eating it. I just thought it's like, oh, it's a healthier lunch option. So that went. And then my kombucha, I told you before we hit record, I think I saw like 190 from a kombucha and we, that was actually in Austin recently. And you went to this amazing restaurant. It's apparently Joe Rogan's favorite restaurant. It's no seed oils. All of the food comes within, comes from within 50 miles of the restaurant. So it's all local farms, gardens, everything, the meat, the salad looked like it was picked from like out back. I mean, just amazing. They only serve wine and beer and I don't really love drinking that. So I was like, I'll get a kombucha right? That'll be like my healthy mocktail. And my blood sugar was just like, whoop. So things that a lot of us would think are healthy can actually be more detrimental. And then for me, ice cream is like my treat. Like my husband and I, maybe once every other month or something, we'll go to this amazing local ice cream place. And it's such a treat. And my blood sugar does fine. Like <laughs> amazing to see. I'm not saying like everyone go eat ice cream every day, right? That's not what we're saying. But, um, but yeah, just seeing that data can really empower you to make, to confirm what is really going on in your body and to not just assume this food is healthy or unhealthy because that's what we have heard our whole lives. So. Uh, absolutely. Right. And, and it's all about being able to include all the foods that you want to include in a way that optimizes your health. Um, and I, I could not agree more. I think everyone always, always has those, oh my gosh, moments. And they think that, you know, oh, I can't believe this is what spiked my glucose. Why is this happening to me? I've been having this for years. I had no idea. Um, and again, there's yeah. lots of different ways for you to enjoy kombucha for the rest of your life. If you want, we can, we can, right. Help. Right. I, I did <laughs> have it. I it. had it on an empty stomach. I hadn't right. eaten anything for probably five or six hours. I was pretty hungry and I went right for half a bottle of kombucha. So yeah, the timing was not good. But and it's again, it's yeah. also, you know, important to read food labels. I always think, you know, kombucha is great. And I love it if someone doesn't really um, wants fermented foods, but doesn't eat dairy or, or, or other things. And so I think kombucha is great, but you have to look at the added sugars. A lot of them will add a ton of added sugars to them. So, um, we yeah. can't all be brewing our own at home, but you just need to make sure that you're looking to see what's a, um, a lower sugar brand. Yeah. This I one remember... I think was 16. I mean, I split oh. it with my husband, but so probably eight grams per person. Yeah. 
it's not terrible, but I remember when kombucha first came out, it was first on the shelves of Whole Foods and they were all five grams. Mm -hmm. And then each year it just ticked up. It was like eight, 10, 12, 20. It's just become another dessert. It's wild. But I'm always interested in the psychology behind it. If you have a spike like that, a lot of people quickly go, oh my God, I can never eat that again. Right. And I think it's important to go, oh, let me run an experiment. Was it, were there added sugars? If there isn't added sugar, is it a microbiome issue? Like, is there something in your biome that's not preferring this? Is there kind of some kind of sensitivity or inflammatory reaction? Any context on, on conversations like that that you have with members? Like, how do we step back and not freak out over particular foods because there's so many variables? Absolutely. Right. It's just, it's, it's having like an open mindset. It's saying, okay, this happened. All is not lost. Right. Don't, you know, don't throw the CGM out the window. Um, you know, you're, you're going to live, not going to die. Gonna die. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> um, but, 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 but absolutely to that point, we can kind of troubleshoot. And some people say it's not worth it. Like, I don't really care to know how to optimize this food. I don't really like it. Or, you know, or I was just testing it out. It's fine. I had a member once who systematically for a week tried different types of pasta and, you know, bands, uh, lent, you know, all the different forms of pasta. And eventually he was like, ah, I don't really even like pasta that much. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, just, just kind of knowing the member and, and, and knowing what, what really is meaningful to them and what is important to them. But it's very, I, I love that you brought up the inflammatory factor because a lot of times, like I said, people will come to us maybe with a recent diagnosis of, you know, a prediabetes or something like that. But a lot of times people will come to us with other types of inflammation or autoimmune issues, right? Like a Hashimoto's or something like that. A lot of people have gut health issues and they're just really looking for some guidance. Like, you know, I, I've got these other factors. I don't know how that's related to my glucose. Right. And as you mentioned, it's, it's that, it's that inflammation that's really driving, uh, what's going on in their gut and then therefore what's happening in their glucose levels. So really important to try and get the whole picture when we're working with people. Um, you know, they might come to us saying, Oh, I just want some weight loss. But when we actually work through it, you know, there's so many other factors that are, and they're like, Oh yeah, well, I've got to tell you, I had SIBO last year, or, you know, I've been taking <laughs> antibiotics for three years and you're like, Oh, well that's helpful. So, you know, yeah. let's, let's work through that too. And, um, so there's multifactorial. Yeah. yeah. I always think the weight loss yeah. thing is such an interesting case because most people think that that's the priority. And then we learn that we get healthy to lose weight. And the CGM is the perfect way to get healthy to lose weight, I think. Right. right. Yeah. 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 It's a good way to look at it. All right. Can we jump into hormones? Hormones. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, let's start with women that are still cycling, what are we seeing as the hormones rise and fall throughout the month with glucose and what, how can we optimize that? Yeah, I think, um, so the first part of your phase, um, is the follicular phase, right? And that's when, if someone wants to be going on a lower carbohydrate diet, if you will, or lower their carbohydrates, you know, that's, that's okay. That the body can feel pretty good about that. It's really more on, um, and, and you can, you can, I like to say you can sort of stress your body a little bit more than if you're working out or, um, I don't even know if you could like plan a bunch of meetings or something, or, or if you are fasting or something, that's when you can really kind of handle a little bit more stress in your life without your body feeling it as, as hard. I think when you get to the ovulation phase and everything sort of, you know, in fuller the ovulation is like 10 to 14, 16, I think, um, in your cycle, that's when you really want to be a little bit more careful. That's where you really want to be like nourishing your body and, and, and trying to take care of yourself a little bit. And then on the second half, that's when it can be really hard to motivate. Actually, you can, we find a lot of dehydration. Uh, women tend to be a little bit more dehydrated in that, um, in that second half of it. And you get those general cravings for carbohydrates. It's really hard to be on a lower carbohydrate 
dietary pattern in that second half. And you really have to become more mindful and aware of what your body is telling you. If your body is asking you to rest and sort of power down a little bit, it's really important to listen to your body in that way, right? Your hormones are taking over, the body is preparing for something, whether you want that something to be happening or not, you know, that's, you have to listen to your body and kind of lean into it. So I think sometimes women think that no matter where they are in their cycle, it's always the same, no matter what. And you're going to feel pretty garbagey by the end of that month. If that's how, if you're treating yourself the same, no matter where you are, that assumes that you're tracking your cycle, right? <laughs> and, you know, sometimes people don't know where they are in their cycle. So I think first and foremost, you kind of need to get your arms around where you are. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. all the women listening are tracking. Hopefully, hopefully. I feel like yeah. most of our audiences, but then there's always the tricky cases where there's irregularity. If you've been on a birth control or you've had some kind of health disorder that has dysregulated or lengthened your cycle. And then, you know, some clients aren't ovulating. Some just have like enormously long cycles and it's really hard to, to connect symptoms because it's so unpredictable. How could we use the CGM to go, okay, potentially like luteal phase, my progesterone is probably rising because I'm also seeing a little rise in glucose. I think that scares a lot of people, but how can we link that back to, oh, I should probably be nourishing, supporting that rise and fall. Correct. You're, you're absolutely right. Right. And we want to be leaning into those foods that are, you know, they, certainly carbohydrates, um, but that are healthier, that are going to have more fiber, that are going to have more nutrients um, and pairing them again with the healthy fats and the protein that the body is craving um, at that time. I think it's also really important to think about the brain fog. Um, you know, a lot of times I think women don't they, they tend to think of it as something that happens later uh, in life when you're going through like the menopause brain fog, but it's the same thing on like a smaller condensed scale um, down there. And what I think is really interesting is that when you're going through the, when you're going through your menopause transition and your estrogen plummets, it's, it's estrogen that helps really carry the glucose into your brain. So when you naturally have those estrogen levels fall, it's a little bit harder for glucose to get up into your brain. Right. And so it's really interesting. Some women, when they, when they, I'm not trying to promote ketosis all the time, but if they, if they sort of taper back on that and they allow more ketones to flow through, it can really be interesting in terms of their mental health or like that, you know, their, their, their mental quickness, which I think is really fascinating. It certainly doesn't work for everyone, but if it's something that you're willing to play around with, um, when those estrogen levels plummet, it can be something you know, that, that, that you might want to play around with, um, in terms of playing around with when you time your ketosis. And that goes into, you mentioned metabolic flexibility. So that's really what we want people to be able to do is to sort of flex in and out of these different dietary sort of patterns, depending on where they are in their cycle, which can be kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Empowering cool. or frustrating. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I find some people really like the cycle syncing schedule, but then it's like, if, it, if something changes in the cycle, symptoms aren't aligning. They're like, what do I do today? Am I allowed to fast? Am I allowed to eat carbs? So totally. Let's we'll check the CGM yeah. and see what it's telling. telling totally. Us. Totally. Yeah. And focusing on that protein again, I think is really, really important. It can really help with lethargy and, you know, tiredness, like you know, tryptophan, like you mentioned before, um, it's the primary amino acid responsible for serotonin production, right? So again, when you're going through those, you know, slower at the end of your cycle, when you're feeling kind of down and tired and, you know, the, you just don't have the motivation and the drive that you do earlier in your cycle, that's a great time to remember that, uh, you, you really want to be leaning into your protein to help also just with general soreness, tissue repair, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. mm. Great point. So what about, go ahead, Renee. You're okay. sorry. So, so does protein kind of stay pretty steady the whole month though, but the fats and carbs you're saying are what we're cycling? Or there was a specific phase where you would up the protein. No, I, I, I wouldn't say you'd want to do that unless you were changing your workout routine based on where you are in your cycle. Oh, okay. Um, got it. Yep. Got it. Yeah. Okay. I think when estrogen good. and progesterone are higher, there is greater utilization of the amino acids, but I feel like most women just need more protein. So well, that, yeah, <laughs> probably don't ever need to say eat less protein. <laughs> Got you're, it. Uh, you're spot on. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. What about for our men? So I think the cycle syncing is really fabulous to create some diet variability leading into the hormonal cycle. But for men, 
that don't have this, they could potentially eat the same way every day, but we kind of see our metabolism stops responding as much if we're eating the same way every single day. So how can men use some variation in absence of a cycle? Yeah, I think, uh, sorry, the question, I just want to make sure I'm understanding the question. Men have a variation in the type of foods that they're eating or since they don't have these hormones that are fluctuating like 30 days out of the month, they can kind of, they don't need more carbs at a particular time. They don't need to worry about the drops in energy because of hormones. But we see if there is a lack of diet variability, we could see not as great metabolic flexibility. So how can men kind of intersperse some variability to just to get better glucose metabolism? Absolutely. Does that make sense? Totally. Yes. So it, exactly. So it's not being driven necessarily by hormones um, in the sense of sex hormones, but I like to really have men key into the cortisol hormone, you know, the, the cortisol rush uh, that a lot of us women included, but that's something that men tend to not really pay attention to. And as you can see, just, you know, basics in your glucose data, uh, you, sometimes you can see a rise in your glucose. Like we talked about earlier, that is not explained necessarily by food or anything else. And we talk about stress levels, right? And so the body sees stress produces cortisol, cortisol finds glucose in your body so that it can fight or flight, you know, chase you know, run away from the tiger or whatever it needs to do. So we will see a rise in glucose that has nothing to do with food intake. And I do see that a lot with men is that they are not seeing, um, they, they're not noticing that their energy levels are being impacted by some of this, these silent stressors in their diet. So that's something that we will talk to them about is, is cycling, maybe cycling a higher carbohydrate versus a lower carbohydrate carbohydrate, depending on the stress levels in their life. Like, are they traveling? Is there work, you know, are there work things going on, workout stress, things like that. So we want, again, that metabolic flexibility, perhaps they're going to go through a week or two of a higher carbohydrate, then they're going to flex down and maybe uh, try and produce some more ketones and do something like that. So all of that in the background context of cortisol can be really fascinating for men and can be really helpful for them to kind of optimize and depending on where they're life is going, they can flex in and out depending on what, what their stress levels are. Mm. Yeah. That's a cool way to, right. to lean into that. So women, we have the hormonal cycle and then men have this, I guess, stress cycle they can lean into. Um, we do too. Cool to- I'm not trying to say yeah, we yeah. don't have stress. <laughs> oh no, women, we don't have any stress. <laughs> no stress. <laughs> yeah. And what do you think about like for men doing a 24 hour fast once a week to kind of kickstart this metabolic flexibility. Yeah. I, I was, I was listening or I read something recently that the amount of testosterone that gets released, even from just a 15 to 17 hour fast is like twofold, fivefold, some, some significant increase, even by just a mild, uh, intermittent fasting. So I think that there can be a lot of benefits to doing some of those slightly longer ones here and there, again, maybe not necessarily for a fat burning purpose, but for also a gut rest. I think a lot of times men might not be as keyed into their gut health issues as women are. It just tends to be higher reported in women than in men. Um, And maybe without realizing it, they do have a lot of gut inflammation. Allowing that gut rest can really be helpful, uh, not just for their uh, glucose control, but also just for their microbiome uh, and a reset on that. Hmm. Awesome. Awesome. I'm curious what you see in I'll just call them athletes, like people that engage in a lot of endurance work or just are constantly exercising, maybe like a little overly enthusiastic. I see a lot of gut disrepair and it shows up in the glucose trends. How do you address that conversation? Like your glucose is showing potentially, because I think the conversation around gut health is not so clear. I know when I ask my clients, how is your gut health? They tell me about how often they poop. They tell me about their motility. They don't tell me about their gut health. Right. So there's not really this bridge between glucose and gut health and how we could correlate and actually optimize. What are you seeing and what kind of conversations are you having in that regard? Um, yeah, so I think we do have a lot of endurance athletes that are you know, really, truly keyed into uh, optimizing their performance for say an upcoming race or something like that. We also have a lot of people that are, 
I'm running my first marathon kind of, uh, you know, or they don't even tell us and they're like, look, I ran a marathon on Saturday. And you're like, why? <laughs> That's so great. <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> and uh, so, so when it comes to, to athletes, we absolutely want to talk to them about uh, fueling before their training uh, post uh, repair, um, um, you know, uh, protein repair, protein intake for muscle repair, all of that. And then we talk about the inflammation around some of those higher, heavier workouts. We see that a lot with CrossFitters. Um, you know, it's a, it's a short period of time that they're working out, but they're potentially doing some damage, you know, and, and we just want to make sure that the recovery is optimal and that they are fueling. A lot of women tend to not fuel before they work out, unless they're a very serious athlete and, and they're very keyed into it. But women will sort of exercise and exercise and exercise and exercise and then finally eat something. Um, and then we can see some GI disturbance again, maybe some glucose issues because they've been fasting, they've been exercising. The body is uh, trying to keep up with the glucose demands, the energy demands. And frequently we will see with a higher intensity workout. In fact, I just was looking at my members' data yesterday and um they had, what did they, they had woken up and they had done an elliptical workout for like 30 minutes, steady state cardio zone two, kind of flat line. And then they went and played tennis for an hour and it was like, woo, like a, you know, a much bigger increase. And so we talked about the difference in terms of uh, the body's needs and, and both uh, workouts had been done fasted. And so it was really interesting to talk to them about, you know, how are you fueling these workouts and what the body needs uh, in order to get the best thing out of the workout. So we're going to, you know, do some testing, do some fueling before and afterwards and, you know, see how we can optimize it. But you did ask about gut health as well in terms of the athlete. And I think a lot of times it goes to the gels and the, the, the pout and, and the, the, the oral rinses and things like that, that they're very wary to eat real whole foods. Um, and it is so crucial to have those whole foods in order for the body to have a good load of fiber to keep uh, the glucose steady. And then a lot of those uh, gels and things have a high amount of fructose, which draws a lot of water into the gut, as maybe your audience already knows, and then can cause a lot of cramping, distress, bloating, bad issues out, out, out outdoors when you're training. Yeah. Oh, gosh. I, I also yeah. just see chaos on the CGM from the gels. But there's this conditioning in the endurance world. I have to fuel, I have to intake sugar or I'm going to crash or my performance is going to suffer. And you, I just see the glucose go like just static. Right. right. So again, experimenting, right? Just trying, being open to trying other things. But that's kind of a tough one because when we're tied so much to performance, it is harder to be a little more willing to to try new things. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's, you have to, what is it? Um, like you have to, you have to admit your faults first. I mean, you have to admit that maybe you don't feel that great. <laughs> maybe you don't want yeah. to admit that and just say, you have to say, listen, maybe yeah. I could feel better. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. 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 I personally don't, I just don't feel great on a fasted workout. And, and that's one of the main reasons I don't work out in the morning. Like, you know, I see people that just, they roll out of bed, they do the 6am workout I'm like, for me to do a 6 a.m. workout, I'd have to like wake up at three, have my water, have my food. And then like, it's like a full preparation because I I just don't feel good at, with a fasted workout. So 4 p.m. is my my jam. So that I can yeah, feel it's important you know, that you honor that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and if your lifestyle can accommodate it, you know, and, and again, we just, we, we try and meet people where they are. And, and if a nighttime workout is where you can get it in, or as you said before too, it's, um, we see there's so much data. There was a study that came out, uh, February about how, but there's better glucose control with 10, uh, three 10 minute workouts throughout the day, then one 30 minute workout. Uh, so again, speaks to the, after you eat, move your feet, kind of get going periodically throughout your day. Don't just do a 30 minute workout and then be sedentary until the next 24 hours. Yes. Right. Yes. I think that study was really awesome. Just move more, move more often. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to complete the hormonal cycle, what happens through perimenopause and then menopause, any changes as we should approach our glucose metabolism differently. Yeah, I think listen, as your as your estrogen levels decline or as they're on that sort of roller coaster down, um, again, I think it can be really interesting for women to take note of their uh, insulin level, you know, sort of their their insulin 
I won't, I won't want to say resistance, but how their body is processing their insulin. And that we can see in the glucose data. So you can see how you're responding to various carbohydrate foods and making sure that you're uh, still optimizing that as best you can. It can be a really interesting time to play around with different times of eating, different, you know, different times of the day that you're eating. Uh, if you want to try fasting, it can be an interesting time to try that as well. Um, there's also just an increase in abdominal adiposity during this time of life. A lot of women think that it has to do with like their metabolism or something like that. It's just the, the body naturally will deposit fat in your abdomen during that period of time. Right. Um, but what we can do is, you know, you can, you can find a healthier lifestyle, uh, you can do lots of different kinds of uh, macro orientation so that you don't deposit as much fat in the abdominal region. Because again, it goes back to that metabolic metabolic syndrome. One of the hallmarkers of that is your waist circumference. So making sure that that's still in uh, a good range is, is super important. And I think, again, it's that interesting notion of estrogen helping glucose Across the blood brain barrier and being really cognizant of, uh, brain fog and kind of, you know, mental, mental acuity. Where are you? Uh, could you be improving that better? Mm -hmm. With the, with that, um, I guess like I would say the belly fat issue, um, is that a hormonal driven thing or is that more glucose driven? Why, like, why does that happen at that age? It's, it's not, it's not glucose driven. Um, it's, but I think what it is, is that if you're taking in again, when you're taking in the basics of taking in carbohydrates and the body is producing enough insulin, you need to make sure that that's matching up. If it's not matching up, the body will likely store the glucose as fat. And that just naturally at that, at, at that age, it will deposit it in the abdominal region. So a little bit, it's sort of that preventative medicine. It's that let's make sure that my insulin is matching up with my glucose intake and that the body, and that I'm using up what I'm taking in. So I'm not in that imbalance and therefore having to store it as fat. Product. Yeah. Even yeah, more important to balance glucose as you get older, because with less estrogen, right, you're less insulin, um, responsive. Exactly. And then with the shift to the adrenals as the ovar ovarian system kind of shuts down and the adrenals take on a lot, there's more stress response and that can definitely drive the belly fat even more. So hmm. I feel like it's having a CGM through perimenopause, even though it could be kind of wacky and chaotic is really helpful. Yeah. And you can, yeah. you can also lean into more estrogen foods. I mean, there's so much research about the benefit to soy foods um, that it's not as scary and, and it's all of those myths have been debunked now and yeah. it can really have a positive impact on women as they are going through that is to take in some of those exogenous sources of estrogen in plant-based form can really be helpful for them as well during this time. Mm-hmm. Great yeah, point. that's a good point. Yeah, I think all the the processed junk soy products kind of uh, ruined the healthy soy <laughs> and the healthy estrogen for everyone. So, yeah, awesome. good to look at quality of that. Good point. Awesome. All right, I think is that a wrap on hormones? I feel like we got through all the phases there. I think I mean, so. Yeah. All right. Well. Catherine, thank you for sharing all of your wisdom with us. If we can ask one final question, uh, something to leave our audience with, one thing they could start doing today to optimize their health and wellness. Can be glucose related or not. One tip. Well, I think I, I already, I think I already led with, I mean, I think I already talked about it. It's after you eat, move your feet. <laughs> Perfect. Um, <laughs> love it. It's the one thing yeah. it's, it's easy, but I don't want anyone to be feeling stressed about it. I, I don't want it to be a stressful thing. Enjoy your meal, enjoy your time with whomever you're eating with, but then get up and go uh, walk your dog, walk around the block, uh, you know, do some chores around your house, but, but get moving. So good. It's we great. call it pasta giada. <laughs> Italian yeah. walkabout. <laughs> yes, abs exactly. Exactly. Yeah. When yeah. in Rome. <laughs> do well, as when, the when in Rome. Rome. <laughs> Move your feet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that. I know. I think sometimes just saving all of my dishes for after dinner is, is helpful because I can't help but be on your feet. So great. I yeah. love that tip. Thank you so much, Catherine, for spending your time with us today. Thank you guys so much for having me. This was wonderful. Can you tell our audience where they can find more of you and learn more about NutriSense? 
Absolutely. Well, if you just say it three times, your phone will pick it up, I'm sure. Uh, but we are all over, <laughs> yes. we're all over social media at Nutrisense IO. We are um, online. And I will say for anyone that's a little bit you know, curious, but maybe still on the fence as to whether this is for them, we have a wonderful blog on our website. We actually call it the journal and it it basically addresses all manner of health conditions or just topics of interest and how managing your glucose can uh, improve those things or how they are related. So I would definitely encourage everyone to go to our website, Nutrisense.io, and you can learn and read more about who we are, but also just more about glucose management in general. Perfect. Yeah. Those articles are so great. Much. I share them with clients all the time. If they have a question, I'm like, just go read this. It's yeah, super yeah. informative. Yeah. Yeah. It's up to us to keep spreading the glucose education. So thank you so much for sharing with our audience today. It was such a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you guys. Yes. And thanks to everyone for tuning in. We'll see you next time.